Good morning, everybody. I see that people are still joining uh, the webinar, so I'll wait uh, just a couple of seconds before we actually really kick off. Okay, good morning, everybody. I am Guillaume van der Loo. I'm a research fellow at the uh, European Policy Center, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to a new episode of our EPC uh, Talks Geopolitics. As you may know, EPC Talks Geopolitics uh, aims to engage globally renowned speakers in a, in a conversation on relevant uh, geopolitical issues. And we are very pleased and honored that we have today uh, Cecilia Malmström with us to discuss the challenges for the EU's trade policy in a, in a shifting or in any case dynamic uh, geopolitical landscape. Now, I don't think that Cecilia needs any introduction, but let me uh, remind you that Cecilia served as a member of the European Parliament from 1999 to 2006, and as a Swedish Minister for European uh, EU Affairs from 2006 to 2010. But obviously, Cecilia became even more known and, and very much respected in the EU bubble and, and uh, far beyond that uh, as a Commissioner for Home Affairs from 2010 to 2014 and European Commissioner for Trade uh, from 2014 to 2010 and 19. So um, it was a rather intense or even turbulent time for the EU's trade policy under her mandate as uh, trade commissioner. In the context of her trade for all strategy, the EU's trade policy went a bit in a different direction with, for example, an increased focus on um, sustainable development, transparency, SMEs. Important trade agreements were signed or negotiated with Canada, Japan, Vietnam, Singapore, Mexico, and there were important developments with regard to the architecture of uh, trade and investment agreements. There are also um, important um, proposals with regard to ISDS and WTO reform, but obviously there were a lot of challenges ranging from the contestation against TTIP at the beginning uh, and CETA to uh, dealing with the Trump administration's uh, trade policies and installed WTO. Since her mandate as trade commissioner, Cecilia is uh, fortunately still contributing to the international trade policy uh, debate, but now in a different capacity as he joined the School of Business, Economics and uh, Law at the University of Gothenburg as visiting professor. And Cecilia is also now non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, where she hosts uh, the Institute's uh, Trade Wind uh, Discussion Series online, uh, which are very interesting. So I invite uh, everybody uh, really to have a look at this and, and, and uh, to check this out. Um, today is actually the perfect timing to discuss uh, the challenges for the EU's trade policy. Uh, we have today, as you may know, the first Trade and Technology Council meeting uh, with the Biden uh, administration. And obviously where the EU wants to team up with the US to tackle crucial challenges from WTO reform to digital and tech and climate. Um, they also will need to overcome several um, disputes and different views, but I'm sure that we'll pick up on that uh, later on. Um, and also, the Commission is doing best not to frame the TTC as a kind of an anti-China tool. Uh, and this discussion also fits in the broader context of the EU's recent trade review, which builds on this concept of open strategic autonomy, which is often a bit debated or criticized, this, this term. Um, but in the area of trade, you see actually how the Commission is trying to, I don't know, um, put some flesh on this bone. For example, if you look how the EU strengthened in its autonomous toolbox, but also its bilateral strategic partnerships and multilaterally um, WTO uh, is, is, is envisaging WTO reform. So, uh, Cecilia, we have really a lot to discuss, and I think we will have to uh, pick our battles today. Um, but um, the participants will have the option after a first round of questions from, from my side to ask about uh, your views on other issues or uh, really to uh, uh, dig a bit deeper on, on, on the issues that we have uh, been discussing so far. So, Cecilia, welcome, first of all. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning to you, Guillaume, and, and thank you for inviting me and good morning to everybody who's watching wherever you are. Good night or good afternoon, maybe. Well, good morning or good evening. And uh, indeed, um, well, maybe let me start with a very open um, question and then we can narrow uh, several issues down. Um, but it has actually been around, I think, two years since your mandate as trade commissioner ended. And obviously, a lot has happened since then. We are living in a, almost in a, basically in a, bit in a different world. We are dealing with the economic and trade-related impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. There was a new Biden administration. There are increased tensions with the EU's uh, strategic competitor, China. 
So uh, taking all of this into account, uh, really to, to kick the things off, what are, according to you, really the main strategic challenges for the EU trade uh, policy in the short and medium term? And are these really sufficiently, do you think, reflected in the EU trade review? Or is the EU actually really dealing with them in an insufficient way? And is the, are they actually, or is the EU capable to dealing with them? So maybe we can kick off with this uh, general question. That's a quick and easy question to start with, yes. Well, obviously, the pandemic has put uh, the European Union, the whole world, under huge pressure. Too many people have died, been hospitalized, and we'd seen very big consequences on our economies and societies. And we're not really out of the crisis yet, globally. And we have seen how trade, on the one hand, has managed to deliver. There's been food and commodities, uh, with some exceptions. And it, it has delivered on, on the supply chains. We have seen also how dependent we are uh, on each other for good and for bad. We are for good because we have seen that, that uh, medical equipment and, and the different components in vaccine have been able to travel the world and, and, and help uh, so many people. But also it has laid out uh, a dependence on, on a few critical metals or, or um, equipment from only one source. So this has, of course, led to a, a discussion on how can we make sure that trade helps in the recovery, because it would play a key role. How can we make sure that trade plays an even stronger role in the uh, defense of the climate goals, sustainable development goals uh, set by the EU and, and, and the world community as well? And how can we make sure that we strengthen multilateral institutions uh, so that we can come out stronger of this crisis and be better prepared uh, for, for, for the next one, because there will be a, another one as well. And in all this relation, you're also discussing the level playing field. We, the European Union wants and needs and should be the promoter of open and fair trade, but it has to be fair as well. You have to make sure that everybody plays by, by the rule book. And when some partners don't, you need tools to make sure that you can you know, be, be strong on this as well. And finding that balance is, is not easy. But overall, I would say that the EU trade uh, policy seems to be based on a lot of continuity. This transparent, uh, value-based uh, defense of, of, of a regulate free trade, but with strong rules uh, in, in based in a multilateral community. Of course, we'll come back to all these issues during the discussion, I, I guess. Yes, but it's been, been a challenge, and it will be as well. So we're not really sure where exactly this will lead and where it will land. Okay. Well, uh, many thanks. And actually, all the priorities that you flagged or identified, supply chains, climate, um, competitive neutrality, uh, China, um, uh, obviously the subject of concern today at the, at the Trade and Technology Council, maybe so. Um, mm -hmm. I think everybody is also curious to um, hear your views on, on what you expect, what the TTC can um, can achieve. Um, obviously, I mean, I think uh, there is a kind of a, a positive and a negative agenda, I think, today on the table. The, the negative agenda is how to deal with uh, the remaining trade disputes, the Section 232 tariffs, uh, data governance, digital taxation. And on the other hand, this is the more positive agenda, as you mentioned, I mean, cooperation on uh, clean tech, supply chains, semiconductors will be, which will be crucial, export controls. So um, my question is, do you think that actually the, the Biden administration is really that different from the Trump administration to make progress on the negative agenda, on the trade disputes? Um, so, um, yeah, what is your view on that? And, and, and do you think actually that um, even with the new Biden administration, I mean, these uh, Trump leftovers, uh, or even, I mean, the trade if you, the disputes before the Trump administration will be, can be, be, can be addressed? And is it really a condition to make progress on, on the positive agenda? Well, as you say, this is a very important uh, question. And the meeting today, the Trade and Technology Council, is a council that was set up during the summit when President Biden was in Europe uh, in June uh, earlier this year. And it's going to be a, a, a forum. It has 10 different working groups, a forum where, where specialists and civil servants meet regularly, but also regularly, and we'll see how regularly, uh, on the highest level. So today in Pittsburgh, uh, Commissioners Vestager and, um, and Dombrovskis are meeting with three secretaries from, from the US, Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, which also shows how important it is for the Americans, and the USTR, uh, Mrs. Tai, and, and uh, Mrs. Raimundo, who's Secretary of Commerce. So this is, of course, a very important signal that on the highest level, these people meet to discuss. And you're absolutely right. There are a lot of tensions still remaining, whereas I think that many in Europe 
welcome a new administration because it's been a tough, um, tough relationships between the EU and US for, for the last four years. But there are still disputes remaining. We still have the, the section 232 on steel and aluminium. I don't think they will be solved today. There is some sort of working group and timetable for that. Also, we do have the long dispute Boeing Airbus, where both partners are sinners, actually. It's it's also EU has also done wrong, wrong there. That is also put on hold when it comes to, to further escalation in order to try to find a solution. So I don't think they would spend time solving this. But for the rest, I mean, the signals we've heard from the Biden administration are rather similar, even if the rhetoric is softer and, and um, the, the, than the last administration, actually. It is America first, it is focus on the workers, there are no trade deals in, in, uh, in sight, they have strengthened the, um, the Buy America uh, regulations, which makes it very difficult for European companies to, to bid on public procurement in the new huge infrastructure package, for instance. And, uh, they talk a lot about WTO, but we haven't really seen any American action in proposing reforms or being forthcoming there. So, so um, th there are disagreements, but there are also a whole lot where we could agree. And I think the, the discussion today will focus on um, issues where, where there's obvious need for, for, for cooperation, investment screening, export control, for instance, something on semiconductors where we both are suffering huge uh, deficits here and how, how can we on the short term cooperate? on this, maybe something on artificial intelligence standards here. It would be good if we jointly could set global standards here because otherwise someone else will do it. And then there are all these global challenges. Uh, China, obviously. Uh, I think the EU and the US share a lot of concerns vis-a-vis -vis China, even if the EU phrased them somehow differently. Uh, but, but there are issues on level playing field on China not fulfilling their commitments in WTO, on state subsidies, on unfair competition, uh, and so on. And I'm, I'm, I'm certain that this will come up uh, as well. Let's see what, what concretely comes today, but at least it's a process that, that will continue. So lots to talk about. And then obviously you have the whole environmental issue, um, mostly related to, to in green investment and green standards, where there's no really agreement. And also there would be good if we could find ways to, to, to look at this uh, with the same lenses. I think data protection, GDPR, uh, privacy shield, these are difficult areas as well. So uh, maybe that will be left to one of the working groups to try to see how, how that comes out. Well, maybe let me just briefly pick up on a few issues that you mentioned, for example, the Section 232 tariffs, because indeed, mm -hmm. I mean, on the positive side, cooperation on export controls, semiconductors, these are important things, and obviously, or most likely, they will set things in, in motion. But on the Section 232 tariffs, the clock is ticking, and I, uh, because the second tranche of EU tariffs will normally kick in the 1st of December, and I saw a statement yesterday from Vice President and Trade Commissioner Dombrovskis that he really hopes to have an agreement on that by early November, so that's in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and as you mentioned, I mean, the Biden administration most likely is not that different from the Trump administration on that front. So I think the position of the EU is we just want to get rid of the tariffs. That's it. But um, do you think that, I mean, what we, could be a creative solution? And now you hear maybe that a kind of a quota, voluntary export to strain mechanism could work. But obviously, I think the EU uh, or the Commission will not be in favor of that. And obviously, we were very close uh, involved in, in the previous discussion on that. So what do you think is actually could be a solution, which is somewhere between having the tariffs in place and the EU's position, just get rid of them? Well, as I said, I don't think this will be solved today because there are people working on it, and that's a good thing. Uh, but, but the EU's view, and also many of the other countries who are affected uh, all around the world, consider that this is, you know, bluntly illegal, these tariffs. They are against WTO, and they are illegal, and they are illegitimate. And also, they're not good for, for even American purpose. Many, many American companies complain of, of, of uh, expensive steel, obviously, because you put tariffs on them. And they have not uh, really served, apart from a very small uh, fragment uh, in, in the US. They, they haven't got done any good to the US either. So they, we should get rid of them, point. Um, and that, that is the view, and that, that is the view that, that uh, Vice President Dombrovsky, uh, the Commissioner for Trade, has, has expressed, and I think he will repeat it. And there is an expectation that the US will, will solve this. And tariff quotas, as the rumors said that they were preparing in the USTR in Washington, is obviously not a solution. It's a little step towards breaking the deadlock, but, but it's not the solution. We should get rid of them. 
and uh, this is what, what what Europe is expecting. And well, it, it's up to the US to find a solution to this. Yeah. Now, another, another issue that you mentioned are the shared concerns that the US and, and the EU have vis-a-vis -vis China, China's mm -hmm. trade distortive practices, or China's increased role or envisaged role as a global uh, standard setter in, in, in the area of digital and tech. Now, uh, you see that the EU has um, difficulties dealing with them bilaterally because obviously, I mean, you had the uh, comprehensive investment agreement, which is completely in limbo after the Chinese mm -hmm. counter sanctions against the EU. Um, so on the one hand, you see that the EU is uh, strengthening its autonomous toolbox, which, for example, this foreign subsidy instruments and then the mm -hmm. other instruments as well that the EU is uh, or the Commission is cooking up. Um, so what do you think is really the best way to engage with China if we don't have the bilateral track uh, at multilateral level with the US and the G? I mean, and in other formats, we have this trilateral format, WTO form, ministerial conference in a couple of um, weeks. Um, and I mean, this autonomous toolbox. So um, yeah, what would be the best approach really to, I mean, engage with China, uh, I mean, autonomously or, or deal with China autonomously and multilateral level? Or is there still a way to do it also bilaterally? Well, I think you, know, you need to do all of that. China obviously is a big economic power. It's an important partner in a way because it's an important trading partner from the European Union, but it's a very complicated partner. And the situation when it comes to human rights has deteriorated during the last years during the, the crisis, Hong Kong, uh, the situation in Xiangyang province, how they treat the Uyghuri minority. And the list of, of uh, human rights violation is very long. And I think citizens and consumers in Europe and in the US and around the world expect leaders to also take this into consideration. Obviously, totally boycotting China is not realistic, but you need to make that point e even stronger. And um, the president of the commission, Mrs. Ursula von Leyen, mentioned in her State of the Union speech last week um, that, that EU needs to be stronger when it comes to forced labor, for instance. And obviously, forced labor is something that is absolutely occurring in the Xiangyang province. And also in the, on the American side, they have expressed the same concern. So here, maybe there is something we can do jointly with our American friends and other like-minded partners to see if we can put pressure on the US on this. And many companies are also looking at strong political support uh, on this when it comes to textile production and, and, and clothing and, and so on. And they want to do something, but of course, one company alone will be very much punished if it acts uh, alone. So here, I don't exactly know what to do, but some sort of, of uh, um, multilateral, at least plurilateral, uh, statement and, and possibly decisions there on, on not to trade with these goods. They are forensic ways you can you can track where the cotton comes from. Uh, the US are quite good at this, for instance. Uh, then you need to push with the US and the, the international community that China needs to deliver what it promised when it joined the WTO. State subsidies, for instance, is not in line with, with, with the WTO and this very strong state involvement with the state puts global competition uh, in, in an unfair side uh, due, due to what China is doing. Here we had cooperation even with the former administration, uh, with the EU, the US and Japan, where we tried to draft new rules in the WTO on these issues. And I think that cooperation needs to continue. Obviously, you need to talk to China as well. You cannot just send them a paper and ask them to send the dotted line. You need to involve China and make them understand that China as a big international uh, player needs to play to, uh, to, to take a bigger responsibility for multilateral rules. It's been enormously favorable for China to join the WTO, but they must stick to the rules. And in the CHI investment agreement, which, as you said, rightly is parked, there were some concessions that China actually made there to put more discipline on state-owned companies, on, on, on non-discrimination, on the more transparency. So, so they can do it if they want. Uh, but, but we must keep on pushing uh, on, on that. And obviously, I think that, that the European Union internally also needs to, to try to unite on, on a more coherent China strategy right now as well, because you, you are only as strong as the weakest link in this. And that goes for all foreign policy in the European Union, of course. Well, um, indeed, in, in the context of WTO, indeed, you can't really uh, draft some provisions or rules on subsidies and just present it to China. And this relates on a bit to really um, uh, the future of the WTO and linking this maybe a bit more on, on, on with uh, the WTO Ministerial Conference in a couple of weeks. Um, what do you expect? And linking this also a bit back to China, 
um, do you think that the WTO is still really capable um, in the short term to really go for uh, all WTO agreements or do you think that really the future is on, on plurilateral agreements? And if you then talk about subsidies, um, how much worth is the, what, what is the value of a uh, plurilateral agreement on, for example, subsidies and state with enterprises without China uh, being uh, being there? So um, basically, my question is, yeah, indeed, what do you think is really what are the prospects for WTO form or the next WTO ministerial conference? And um, yeah, what how which could or would China fit in there? Well, WTO is and has been this long before the, the pandemic is in great need of reform and modernization and updating uh, on all areas. And it's very good now that we have a, a very firm and determined new director general, Dr. Ngozi, who is traveling around the world to try to understand the different sensitivities of the member states and see how she can put forward this. The ministerial in Geneva uh, is, is an important opportunity to meet on the highest ministerial level and, and hopefully uh, Dr. Ngozi and her team have, have you know, tried to understand what are the realistic expectations from, from the, the, the capitals. But it will not be the moment when WTO suddenly transforms into a super modern efficient organization who makes decision every day. It will be a gradual process because you need to reform both the decision making processes, it needs to be much more transparent. They are, tons of different working groups, half of them could probably be abolished and made, made more efficient. There are negotiations going on on a, on a multilateral level on fishing, fishery subsidies, difficult, but there's progress. It would be wonderful if that, that progress could be announced uh, to show that, that WTO is still alive and kicking and, and making, ma making um, progresses. And there are some, some plurilaterals as well. I, I don't think we should exclude plurilaterals. Plurilaterals are good. They should be open for everybody. And if China joins some of them, but not all of them, fine, let them take their time. There's uh, one on, on investment facilitation and one on uh, domestic services, Qu quite technical, but advanced. And then there's one very important where both China, US and, and the EU are engaged on e-commerce. Probably will not be concluded in November, but progress can be announced. And then there are other work on, on um, women in trade, uh, where, where lots of work ha have been done in different, uh, different foras. There will be some sort of announcement on the health issue, I think, not the waiver because that negotiation seems to be stuck, but, but something where WTO together with a lot of other organizations, WHO, IMF, World Bank are discussing, can we do something to be better prepared for, for the next pandemic and also uh, help us out? Uh, of this. And then for the future, I think it is key that WTO engages in the climate issue, because now we see climate proposals and, and carbon emission um, taxing mechanisms or similar things appearing in the US, in, in Australia, Japan, being not in Australia, but Japan, uh, in the EU. We need to have some global order in this if we want to avoid uh, big trade tensions. This is too early, but at some point we need to have global responsibility on this. So the WTO has a huge role to play. And I think on some of these measures, we can absolutely count on China to, to engage. And we should push and we should invite them uh, to, to take responsibility because although all the concerns we have vis-a-vis -vis China, we need to have them on board to reform, reform the multilateral system. Otherwise it won't work. And it is in China's interest as well, as I said. Actually, I want to pick your brains on a lot of issues that you that you mentioned, but um, you have to be brief because I want to leave ample time for the for the participants. To we ask can have questions. coffee in Brussels. <laughs> well, but One um, of these days. maybe before we go um, to the, the to the audience or, or the participants, maybe one. Um, final broad question that relates to really the, the nexus between trade and, and non-trade uh, objectives and obviously it's a challenge how the EU's trade policy can be used to leverage um, or as, 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 a, as a kind of a tool to I don't know to pursue non-trade objectives such as the promotion of human rights sustainable development climate all issues that you just uh, mentioned and uh, this became an important aspect of the EU's trade policy under your mandate. And now we see a lot of action on that front with autonomous measures, the due diligence proposal that is expected. Last week, we had a proposal for the revision of the GSP. Uh, mm -hmm. Bilaterally, in a couple of weeks, we will have the review of the EU's uh, trade and sustainable development chapters and trade agreements. Um, but in bilateral relations, you still see that this is a difficult balance if you look at um, I mean, it, the EU is quite capable to conclude ambitious agreements with TSD chapters with like-minded countries and even with Canada. I mean, again, uh, 10 member states will need to, still need to ratify it, although uh, this is provisionally applied. But with China and Mercosur, you see the EU negotiates an agreement. There are some good provisions on TSD 
in these agreements. Some people will say it is not enough. Uh, other people will say, okay, it's better than nothing. So um, actually, how do you think that this discussion will um, continue over the next months and, and, and even years, really about uh, yeah, the balance between trade and non-trade objectives and, and how to I don't know, walk this thin line between these two uh, goals? Well, it is a, a thin line. Trade is part of the geopolitical strategy in a way, because through trade agreements, you don't only facilitate trade, which can lead to... to job growth investments and so on but you also bring people together and you discover new areas of cooperation where where you you, you can go far beyond the, the the trade area to cooperate and very often from the eu side trade agreements are are embedded in partnership agreement or association agreement which is much broader and that's a good thing and i think the eu should keep on pushing to include sustainable development respect for basic labor laws uh, human rights related to 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 trade uh, matters etc etc and this is not only the eu i mean this will be the trend globally as well the cptpp also has provisions on this and some bilateral agreements have been done as well so we should con uh, co continue to do that and trade will probably need to take an even more responsibility for, for, for these issues as we see with the CBAM proposals. I mean, shipping will pay its part while being included now in the ETS system and so on. So there will be more to do, but, but trade cannot solve every problem because at one point you run into a wall where you just don't get any further with your, with your partner. With like-minded, it's easier, but with others with whom you might have interest to engage anyway, you can't push it uh, too, too much. And where exactly is that balance? And then you have the citizens, you have the European Parliament, you have consumers who have you know, totally legitimate concerns. But then there's also a, a concern that at one point you have to sign that trade agreement and to make, make it work as well. You mentioned Mercosur. There, I think it is, it is a very good agreement. I'm, I'm proud of that. And we should make sure that it is implemented. But there will have to be amendments in the, in the um, sustainable development chapter, especially from the, we need more internal market. Sometimes we think the Sorry, we just, lost the last, uh, Cecilia, we just lost you the last five seconds, I think. If you just could repeat uh, the last five seconds. It was an interesting point. You said uh, Mercosur, good agreement, but you, I think if I understand you correctly, your position is that the TSD chapter could be, uh, I don't know, improved. Mercos or? Yeah, Mercosur, we need to beef up and have more commitments from Brazil on this regarding the forests and Amazonas and so on. But sometimes I think the EU lacks a little bit of self-confidence. I mean, we have the biggest internal market in the world. We are a very attractive trading partner, the Brussels power to set regulations and standards has global effects. So we, we should, you know, we are a strong partner and we, we should welcome that countries want to trade with us. And then you need to find exactly that balance. I think we can go a little bit further and with some countries even further, uh, but, but at one point you also need to decide, is it worth it to have a trade agreement and then use other tools to try to push on the sustainable development uh, area or not. And, and I don't know where that balance is, but this is something that, that policymakers and the commission needs to have that discussion with the European Parliament and the, the, the minister. I'm not saying we should go back, absolutely not, but, but there's a limit on how far further you can go uh, today and in, in the future. Yeah. Many thanks. And I'm sure that there will actually be more questions about this topic uh, because actually now I invite um, everybody around here to um, ask uh, your questions in, in the chat box. Uh, please briefly state your name and affiliation, and also please uh, keep your questions uh, short and snappy and to the point and, and avoid uh, long comments uh, so that I can see uh, the wood for the trees. So uh, while we are waiting for maybe um, a couple of questions, uh, because I see them coming in, maybe one brief uh, final question from my side. Um, we see in this concept of open strategic autonomy that the EU is really uh, ramping up its or um, is, is flexing its muscles with all these new, uh, very often proposals. We had a, a few recently initiatives on investment screening, the modernization of the, uh, of the enforcement regulation, but um, we so will soon have this very um, uh, this anti-coercive uh, instrument, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people are looking forward to to see what the Commission will propose on, on, on that. There is uh, international procurement instruments. I don't know. I, we don't have to go through the entire list, but you see a lot of instruments, um, autonomous trade instruments. And my question is also for you, how do you see this evolving in a sense that, I mean, what will be the difference between the EU's 
protecting its its trade interests um, and protectionism. And um, I mean, the, very often it are still commission proposals. So it will be, how do you think that member states will react and then also the European Parliament? And in the end, if we have these tools and in place, do you expect that uh, they will only be there to the, for the deterrent or if, if you think that actually the commission will make full use of them? Um, so um, while uh, I give you some time, uh, the audience some time to ask uh, several questions. Obviously. Go yeah. ahead. No, but if you want to be a, a strong trading partner in the world, defending the multilateral system and rule-based trade, you also need to make sure that there are rules and when they are broken, that there are consequences. So I think it is correct from the EU to make sure that, that there is a level playing field when partners do not respect the rules, that there are tools to deal with that. Some are bilateral, some are, are on, on a higher level where we need to, to, to make sure that the appellate system works in, in the WTO as well. And also making sure that we, um, that, 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 you know, that they, the enforcement is not only something on paper, but uh, that it's actually worked. But, but it, these are really hard things to do because of course, shall you punish a whole country or only sections of it and so on. I mean, we've seen that before that it's easy to say, but really hard to, to do despite good intentions. Um, but, but there's a thin line to go between protecting and protectionism because EU should protect its interest, absolutely, but it should still welcome uh, open trade, rule-based trade and not all these uh, discussions globally on decoupling and regionalization. To a certain extent, yes, but we should not break the, the supply chains that has served us so well and flexible. This is nothing that should be steered by from Brussels, in my view. Um, and then, of course, we need to be a bit more self-reliant on, on certain key medical equipment, of course, for, for the future. But, but um, setting up, you know, there are some rare... You know... Sorry, Cecilia, we just lost you the last... 10 seconds uh, after uh, and, and the comment on supply chains. If you just could uh, briefly repeat, I don't know, or, or what you mentioned, the last 10 -ish seconds. Uh. No, I said the supply chains have basically worked and they, they should work. And we should not try to, to regionalize them unnecessarily because you know the, the fact that we trade with each other, that, that we, we, uh, we have this wide cooperation has been good for the EU economy and will be good in the future as well. So cutting that can have very severe consequences. Okay, many thanks. And then um, let me look at the, the questions, for example. Uh, from um, um, Tobias Scherke from the Egmont Institute. Um, he's asking, um, are we too focused, uh, linking a bit on what we have been discussing before, uh, are we too focused on the, on the EU's unilateral uh, regulation and the Brussels effect, rather than really investing more in um, regulatory cooperation um, with partners uh, from the very start, for example, in the digital sphere? I mean, we have been discussing the TTC and best case scenario, we will have, a, I don't know, an agenda for cooperation on that issue, but this is only with the US. Um, do you think that indeed we are focusing too much on, on, on Brussels regulatory power or, um, I don't know, how um, mm. can we um, look, I mean, zoom out a bit and also look on how the EU could cooperate internationally and what can be done um, on that front, not only with the US. No, but the EU cooperates a lot with international standard setting organs and many of EU uh, regulations and standards are also international standards, and that is, of course, the best. But sometimes uh, the EU is, is running before, uh, and that's also to protect the internal market, to make sure that we have in, in internal standards. Uh, and we are also trying to, to recognize, if not harmonizing, but at least, uh, you know, facilitating the, the, the standard setting procedures and the certificates and so on between countries in, in our trade. Uh, agreements. So with the US, this is a discussion that's been going on for decades, actually. Uh, it's really hard because in the EU, the Commission sets the standards. In the US, you have a hundred different agencies, some private, some public, and, and that's a different process. So it's technically really hard to agree with the Americans on, on, on this because we have such different historical procedures. 
but that's why we should focus and that's probably what what what, what the gentleman who asked the question is that we should focus on on future standards in the digital in the nanotechnology in environmental standards and so on and this is where starting with the us is, is a good start and then we could uh, work with other partners as well and as well in international uh, for us because uh, of course especially when it comes to these uh, new new technologies you need as much as possible international standards um, well, many thanks. And um, zooming out a bit geographically, uh, there are actually a couple of questions, for example, from Jan van Her from BASF about, um, I think your answer can be very long or very short. How about relations with India? Uh, but maybe we can um, zoom out a bit. And uh, we have been discussing trade relations with, with the US. But how indeed to deal with uh, trade partners or partners that may be not that interested in an ambitious trade agreement? And obviously, this does not only relate to India, but also to Russia. I mean, one of the biggest trade partners of the European Union, but with whom the EU doesn't really have a, an agreement. So um, then the question would be how to, I mean, how do you see this developing and what would be the best approach to deal with uh, countries that may be that, not that interested in, in, in an ambitious trade agreement with the EU, especially one involving or including TSD related provisions? Well, Russia is a special case, of course. Relations are quite frosty for political reasons. So I think on a short-term perspective, nothing will really happen with, with Russia uh, on, on this because this is far beyond uh, trade. This is, uh, you know, has to do with Navalny. It has to do with, with, uh, with Crimea, Donbass uh, and all that. So, so I don't see member states engaging in this in, unless we, we see a solution to, to, to these conflicts. On India, we have tried, we've tried so many times to engage uh, with India. And although the, the discussions are always frank and friendly, we are very far from each other. There was recently a new India EU summit deciding that again, we should try to aim for a free trade agreement. But if you look into the details, I mean, the, the, the Indian ambitions are very much below European expectation. And even if you try to narrow them a little bit, there's still a, a long way to, to, to go. Uh, so maybe with India, you should try to seek, you know, very limited agreement to start with, just to get a, a process uh, ongoing. But then you have the member states. And you have Could it be, for example, on investment only? I think this is what we, it's now. Well, we have suggested, yeah. yeah, we have suggested this uh, as well, uh, to replace the different investment agreements that, that bilateral member states have, uh, etc. But it's it's been quite uh, tough, actually. And the European Parliament and, and member states, uh, you know, due to, to, to their national parliaments are putting demands, uh, rightly so, I think, that, that we should have ambitious trade and sustainable development chapters. You can't just exclude them with some partners just to facilitate uh, a trade agreement, but maybe you should start with something minor with India just to get the process going. But, but this has been discussed for a long time and unfortunately very little progress. Okay, if I can then maybe bring in one other region or actually continent, Africa. <laughs> <It's> Africa. <laughs> and yes. indeed, I also know your mandate were the first long term ideas of a continent to continent FTA in the context of the African continental free trade agreement. So, um, what do you think? Yeah, what we determine, how do you see this developing? And we see some new proposals also flanking the existing bilateral APAS with investment agreements as well mm -hmm. now. Um, could this be kind of a stepping stone to a broader uh, agreement or could this only be sectoral or in any case, uh, I'm happy to, I would be very interested to hear your views on that. Well, I would hope on a long term, of course, for a region to region trade agreement with the EU and the African Union, but we're not there yet. But what's happening in the, in, on the African continent is very exciting. The African free trade um, agreement entered into force. It's still very modest. It's still very premature, but it's still they're working. It's a huge continent. It has huge potential. And I think the EU, the regional EPAs and other agreements will have to be stepping stones. And we need to support them as much as possible to make sure that what we do with African regions is not something that is hindering the intercontinental uh, integration so that it can be stepping stones. So we can share some experiences in, in customs cooperation, in the rules of origin, in, in these technical issues that are so important for trade uh, to, to work. So I, I see a, a lot of potential in, uh, in, in trade between EU and Africa, but we need to make sure that we have thorough dialogue with the African Union and to make sure that, that it goes hand in hand with their grand intercontinental ambitions as well to see how we can help there. Okay. We tackled almost basically the entire world very briefly so far. And actually there's another uh, question on 
on the impact, bringing in Australia and what happened last week, obviously with the, the, the entire submarine issue. Um, there is a question from Valentin Stanchu. Um, what do you think there would really be an impact on the Australia EU Australia free trade agreement negotiations or after I mean the dispute that we had? But maybe more interesting would also or also interesting would also be: Do you think that I mean not only this submarine deal, but also what happened in Afghanistan, that this really harmed the trust uh, of the EU in the US, and could this really have an impact on, for example, really? in concrete terms, the DTC would evolve. Do you think that really, maybe not in, on the side of the commission, but in some capitals, really there was some um, damage after, I mean, the recent geopolitical developments. Um, do you think um, that this is the case or not, or somewhere in between? Uh, that's actually several questions in one, but on, on the EU-Australia agreement, I can really understand the French anger, absolutely. Uh, I, I think they felt betrayed and, and they, they felt that things were happening behind their back and there was a lack of transparency in communication, absolutely. That, however, should not, in my view, affect the negotiations going on between the EU and Australia, because that was a French-Australian bilateral issue. Uh, we can show our solidarity. Uh, but the, the, the negotiations with Australia, an important partner and friend, should, should continue. Um, and, and then they're not done yet. There's some, still some, some work. So, so I hope that will not affect this um, on, on, a, on, on, on an EU level. When it comes to, to the, the, the lack of trust between the EU and the US, both on this um, ICUS issue, but also on, as you mentioned, Afghanistan, the timing and, 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 and the, the, the whereabouts of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Obviously, there was a lack of communication between the EU and, and, and the US there, and the US could have handled this better. Uh, so there, I think there, there are reasons to, to, to sort of complain. And I can only hope that, that the EU and the US will find ways to, to, you know, to sort this out, to talk. There is an upcoming meeting with President Biden and President Macron, that's very good. They can hopefully clear things out uh, bilaterally, but these these talks need to continue in NATO, but also uh, between the EU and the US. Today at the TCC, this will of course play into the shadows. It will be there, the, the elephant in the room, but it will not really affect the outcome, I, I hope, because this has a very focused uh, agenda. Um, but there is that shows that there is a lot of mending and there's a lot of trust building to be made between EU and, and the US. But still, we are so important partners. So we can't afford this uh, to, to, to not force us to continue to, to repair and, and to, to um, strengthen uh, our relations. Right. Well, you will know in a couple of hours how uh, stubborn the French were in the DTC talks. Um, well, um, another question on uh, one of the few geographical areas that we were not didn't cover so far is the Gulf. Um, uh, Birgit Lusser uh, is uh, asking you on uh, the prospects on resuming uh, trade talks with the Gulf, um, uh, as it would be of key interest to us here and the EAS in charge uh, of relations with the GCC. Uh, thanks, mm -hmm. Birgit Lusser. Um, so, um, yeah. What would be your no, on, on, on thank you very course. much for, for, for that question. I'm, I'm afraid I can't really answer in detail because this is also something where negotiations started with the Gulf Council and then they were stalled and then there were attempts to resume them again. And then nothing has really happened the, the, the last, well, the, during the COVID times. So exactly where we are on this, uh, I, I don't really know. I'm not fully updated if anything has happened the last month on this, but obviously this is also something that, that should be at least looked at, where, what are the prospects, fully realizing that the sustainable development chapter will not be an easy thing with, with that part. Mm. Um, many thanks, and actually there is another interesting question bringing us back to Africa and China uh, from Joost van uh, Irsel, who is uh, flagging that obviously, I mean, EU-Africa cooperation in the long term or even now is not that I mean, obviously, you can't ignore China's um, activities or, or presence uh, in Africa. So um, the question from you is this, um, basically your views on that, uh, as indeed uh, China has a, a thinner agenda, uh, politically speaking, uh, uh, than, uh, than the European Union. And um, to what extent do you think this is really a, a problem? And to, to the extent that, I mean, yeah or to an extent China really can complicate, uh, or China presence in Africa really can complicate, um, yeah, EU-Africa cooperation, or that actually uh, African countries just are not that interested in, in, in the EU. Uh, on that, on no, but it has, 
it has already corporate, uh, complicated relations. Uh, and I, I think we, we, can, we can focus on the Belt and Road and, and this whole initiative and what China has done in Africa, but it also shows that the, the Western world, the European Union, US and others were not, you know, we were not active. We left a vacuum there. And that is what's coming up now in the discussions on building back better on the G7 initiative. I mean, there are different names for this, but they, they all aim at creating some sort of alternative, investing in, in Africa and in parts of Asia as well, fully on infrastructure, both physical and, and digital and others, and to, to sort of be an alternative where we also include, you know, full transparency, uh, the rule of law, respect for labor rights and environmental considerations, which China obviously is not including, even if they say that they will improve this matter right now in the, in the, in the coming uh, Belt and Road initiatives. So I think th this also show that we were not present and we left a vacuum. So, so that, that should give also reason for self-criticism. But the G7 statement from this summer and Mrs. Uh, von der Leyen's statement in, in the State of the Union that the EU should focus on this and put a large sum available as well for, for this uh, kind of cooperation it, it is a good thing. Uh, I just hope that that will, you know, that we will coordinate efforts and make sure that it's efficient and, and, and targeted. Okay. Well, many thanks. And I see that we still have uh, several questions, but I'm afraid that we, uh, yeah, the uh, the format is also trying to be short and snappy, but obviously, I mean, we had, had so much to cover, but um, I think we um, have to end uh, the show uh, already here. Uh, but um, the good news is that you are still very active at the Peterson Institute and at universities. So obviously, I think we will all follow what you will uh, yeah, cook up uh, in, in your new positions uh, uh, and, and to hear your views on, on, on the issues that we have been discussing so far. So um, I want to thank you very much for uh, this conversation. And I hope um, that we meet and that EPC can welcome you in Brussels as, as soon as possible. And uh, I wish you all the best uh, in, uh, in all your new adventures. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Thank you to EPC and thank you to, to, to the audience for this possibility to discuss important matters indeed.